I told you what the reception of the Spirit is like, what happens, what you can expect to happen, some kind of spontaneous spiritual speech overflowing from the mouth. Now I want to ask how did they receive the Spirit? We've asked what happened when they did, but how did they? Did it just come out of the blue unexpectedly at an arbitrary moment chosen by God? No, the answer is they sought that gift. It was not sought before repentance, faith and water baptism. The only case of anyone receiving the Spirit before water baptism was Cornelius and his household. And that was very simply because no one but no one would have given them water baptism before that. So they wouldn't have had it. Peter wouldn't have done. He couldn't conceive that Gentiles could be part of God's family. But as soon as he knew they had received the Spirit, he said, we've got to baptize them now. God has accepted them. We must. And it's interesting that he argued when he got back to Jerusalem and they said, what are you doing? going into a Gentile home. He said, listen, they received the Holy Spirit just as we all did. Which means that the experience of Cornelius was not unusual. It was just unusual for a Gentile to get it. But it was the same as everybody else's. Everybody received in the same way in the New Testament by being filled to overflowing. Now, after someone was had repented, be believed, and been baptized, then they sought the gift. And they sought the gift for them in two ways. First, praying. That's essential to receiving the gift of the Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen simply says, How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who go on asking? Jesus himself did not receive the Holy Spirit's power until he prayed for it. And it says, after he came out of the Jordan, after his baptism in water, as he was praying, the dove descended. So he was praying. Likewise, before the day of Pentecost, what were they doing between the ascension and Pentecost? They were asking. They were praying. And that is why, time and again, when Peter and John came to Samaria, they'd repented, believed, and been baptized. It says they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Paul at Ephesus prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So prayer is one way of seeking. The other thing they did was to lay hands on people, which is a very intensive form of prayer. To touch someone you're praying for is very important. You touch them when you're concerned about them. You touch them when you want something for them. How often if you visit someone sick in hospital, you just hold their hand while you talk to them? You want to communicate something physically, and that's what they did. In fact, Moses laid hands on 70 elders and they received the Holy Spirit. They prophesied. So this is a normal way. So normal that in Hebrews 6, the writer doesn't say repentance, faith, baptism, and receiving the Spirit. He says repentance, faith, baptism, and the laying on of hands, as if every reader would understand what he was referring to. We need to do much more of this after baptisms. Uh, I was in a crusade in Dundee last year for a whole week. What a week that was! On the first night, I, I work with a friend whom some of you might know, a converted gypsy who has a real gift of uh, knowledge, and so I preach and he makes the appeal. And boy, does it work that way. So on the first night, he made the appeal and he said, there's a man here who committed adultery in a blue seaside chalet last week. So you, you better come out and get it forgiven. And a man walked straight out. And he said, there are four more couples cheating on each other, one with a red front door, one with a blue front door, one with a green front door, and one with new white railings around the house. And four couples walked out. He said, there are 55 more people who need to repent, and 55 more walked out. And this was just the first night. On the second night, he said, there are people here who are in debt. And you don't realize that debt is a sin and needs to be forgiven and repented of and put right. And we found that over two-thirds of a congregation were in debt. 
and they began to repent of this and found out how they could get out of debt. So we had repentance for three nights. On the fourth night, we opened up the baptistry. There was a pool in the church building, and we were there till midnight baptizing people in water. And as they were baptized, after they came up out of the water, we laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. It was a marvelous crusade. The only trouble is we got to the end of the week and we realized we hadn't mentioned faith. <laughs> but it had been there all the way through, but we'd been going hard after repentance, baptism in water and baptism in the Spirit. I preached in an Irish Presbyterian church in Belfast six weeks ago. And uh, I thought when I went in and saw a thousand Calvinist faces that nothing would happen. Boy, they looked hard. But things began to happen. People got healed in the service. And the pastor rang me later and said he'd baptized 35 of his members, including an elder. And that most of them had come out of the water and were speaking a new language, including his own wife. And he was just over the moon. Another little side effect, the leader of the local Freemasons had burned his apron. Oh, I like it when things happen, don't you? Real things. Now then, they prayed and they laid on hands. Now the best time to do that, and when they did it in the New Testament, was at the beginning of the Christian's life. And I've found that's the best time to do it, as we did it in Dundee. Because people who've just come to Christ are wide open to everything and they don't have fears and inhibitions. The longer a Christian goes without that gift, the harder it gets. And the more inhibitions and fears are set up. And the trouble is, some of you listening to me are so concerned about your own spiritual condition, and what I'm trying to tell you is, whatever happened to you, don't rob the new converts of these four things. That's my concern. Not so much old Christians as new babies. Please share that concern. But I'm afraid wherever I teach these four things, people come, well, what about me? What about me? Where do I, s you know? And yes, some of you are not firing on all four cylinders. Some of you will go and get baptized as the result of today. Some of you will go and ask your leaders to lay hands on you and pray for you till you receive this gift. Some of you will even go home and repent of things. In a meeting last week, the Lord told me there was a couple there living together and not married. And bless them, they were the first to come out afterwards and confess it and repent and separate and plan a proper marriage in the sight of God. I like it when that happens. That's real. That's where the rubber hits the road, as we said earlier. Now then, supposing you've prayed for somebody with the laying on of hands and they haven't received the gift. Where do you go from there? Well, there are a number of possible reasons why they haven't. First of all, they may have not fully repented, and that needs to be checked up first. Secondly, they may not have acted in faith towards the Lord yet. That may need to be checked. Thirdly, they may not have been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus in water. So the first thing you do when somebody fails to receive the gift is check out on steps one, two, three but you may find those are all perfectly all right. So you begin to ask, well, do they know what to expect? Some people have never seen someone receive the Spirit. They don't know what to expect. Another problem is that some people don't know how to receive. A gift must be received, and receiving is not passive, it is active. You will never have the gift of a new language until you speak. On the day of Pentecost it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak. It doesn't say he began to speak through them, it says they began to speak. You'll never heal anyone unless you heal them. You don't know you've got a gift till you use it. You don't know if you've got a musical gift until you sit at the piano and bang the keys. Then you will discover if you haven't, <laughs> as well as if you have. You don't know what you've got until you try, until you use it. Some people have just tried babbling, for example. That's not the gift of tongues, but it often gets them over the inhibition of hearing funny sounds come out of their mouth. And then before they know where they are, they're speaking clearly a language with syntax and grammar. You don't know what you've got until you use it. 
you receive actively by doing what you're asking for. Peter didn't know he could walk on water till he stepped out of the boat. It was no use him sitting in the boat and say, I'm praying for a gift of walking on water and I'm not going to get out of this boat till I know I've got a gift of walking on water. Nothing would happen. He had to try it. He had to step out and do it. And there is an active reception of the gift. But I've found that with a lot of older Christians there are fears that have been built up. Especially in England where we are scared stiff of emotion. And there are fears of losing self-control. There are fears of what other people might think. There are all sorts of fears. And then one of the deepest problems I've encountered in receiving this gift is people who have had false teaching in two directions. Some fellowships have taught their members, if you get tongues, that's of Satan. And the inhibition that sets up, listen, that teaching is very near the unforgivable sin, which is not committed by people outside the church, it's committed by people inside. And the unforgivable sin is to call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. Be very careful before you ever say something is of Satan. But if that has been said to someone, the fear it produces is enormous. Jesus knew we'd have that kind of fear and he said, listen, which of you asking your father for bread would find he gives you a stone. Which of you asking your father for fish would be given a scorpion? How much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Don't ever be afraid that father will give you the wrong thing. The only people who need to fear a tongue from Satan are those who've been dabbling in the occult and have not repented of it fully. The other fear that's due to false teaching is the teaching that all these supernatural things are not for today, that they belong to the days of the New Testament, the days of the Apostles, and have died out. Rubbish. These gifts never died out. St. David of Wales, March the 1st, you've heard of St. David of Wales? When he was chosen to be bishop, he went off to Jerusalem. He wanted to be consecrated bishop in Jerusalem to receive a special anointing in the holy city. It took him nine months to walk there. But he got only part of the way. He got to Gaul, to Lyon in France. And there it says in his diary, the monks who went with him kept a journal. It says, Ye Holy Father David came to Gaul. And there ye holy father David was baptized in ye holy ghost and spake in other tongues as in ye days of ye apostles. I love telling the Welsh that St. David was a charismatic. They think Pentecostalism began in 1904, but Bishop David belongs to the 6th century and he knew all about this, as many others through the ages have known. But you know, it's amazing how many have been taught, often among the brethren, who know their Bible so well but don't know it all and they've been taught this was for the early days of the church and not for us today. So people think, well, if it's not for today, why should I ask for it? You are commanded to covet the gifts of the Spirit. Covet them. The only form of coveting a Christian is allowed. The only form of coveting a Christian is commanded and that's covet the gifts others have. Want them for yourself. Go on wanting them. Covet them until you got them. That's a command of the Lord. Well now, those are some of the problems we come across, but national temperament is a huge problem. The British don't like to show things. You know the public school Christianity? Don't let anybody know what you're feeling. <gasps> Do you know one of the things I've noticed is that Man after man who has received the gift of the Spirit has learned to cry again for the first time since there were boys. And Jesus was a man who could weep. And it's a sign of manhood that you can weep as well as laugh. And I've noticed again and again that the Holy Spirit releases inhibited emotions. It doesn't cause emotionalism. That's worked up from below but he releases emotions and we're afraid of that. Why be afraid of letting your feelings show? Makes worship much more interesting and God enjoys it more when we let him see how we feel 
and not just tell him. And the other big, big inhibition is that evangelical tradition has not included the gifts of the Spirit. The reason is that evangelical tradition goes back to the Reformation. And in the Reformation they rediscovered Jesus Christ. They did not rediscover the Holy Spirit. And that's left us with a kind of funny trinity. Someone has said the Catholic trinity is Father, Son and Virgin Mary, but the Protestant trinity is Father, Son and Holy Scripture. And it is tragically true that many evangelical Christians know the Holy Scripture better than they know the Holy Spirit. How would you think if somebody knew your letters better than they knew you and yet said they loved you? You should know the Holy Spirit better than you know the Holy Scripture because the person is more important than the book and our Trinity is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. All right, I must now begin to wind up. This is the final talk and I've got a lot more to pack in and that clock is racing against me. All right, back to theology I'm afraid in this last section to touch a very deep issue that's been just under the surface all today. And this is where we've got to do something very hard and that is to unlearn something. I find learning comparatively easy, though as I get older, I told you I'm in my 60th year and I find learning is not as easy as it used to be. But unlearning is harder than ever. Do you know what I mean by that? Changing the way you think about something. We've all grown up under preaching, under certain teaching which we've assumed was right and when you look into the Bible you find it may not be quite right. So we need to unlearn. I find that exciting. I still find new things in the Bible I never saw before. It's exciting unless you're afraid of new things. Well now, you know the typical sinner's prayer that is used in most evangelism. In fact, I've quoted one in this book and I'll just read it for you because it's quite typical. It's the one most widely employed. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now I turn from my sins and open the door of my heart and life. I receive you as my personal Lord and Saviour. Thank you now for saving me. Amen. That's the one that will be most widely used this year in evangelism. It's good as far as it goes, but it's terribly inadequate. Let's just run through the four things. Repentance. What is there in that prayer of repentance? Well, it says, I turn from my sins, but from which sins is the person turning? There's no mention. And repentance is specific. Remember that? There is faith there, but it doesn't say, I believe in you, Jesus. It says, I receive you which we've seen puts a person on the wrong track. There is nothing in there about baptism in water whatsoever. There is nothing in there about receiving the Holy Spirit. And if you listen carefully, God isn't even mentioned. And you repent toward God, not toward Jesus. You repent toward the one you've hurt and whose laws you've broken. So it is seriously inadequate. And then having given only one and a half of the four steps, it tells the person and now say thank you for saving me as if they now are saved. Now I'm sorry, this sounds critical, but that prayer has been used with the majority of people making decisions for Christ in the Western world and it has given them one and a half out of the four steps that in the New Testament constitute new birth. It means that many people are being passed on to churches as born again when they're hardly born again, when they're half born again, and they need a whole lot more to help them. But if they've already been told you're saved, it's difficult to show them, for example, that baptism in water is part of being saved or that receiving the Spirit is part of being saved. 
But the real problem, and this is where I come to the theological problem and the deepest root problem we've been skirting around all today, what does that prayer mean by thank you for saving me? What is it to be saved? When somebody asks me, do I need to be baptized to be saved? I just reply with another question, saved from what? Because that alters the whole question. Now let me try and put up on the board the different views. I wish the board was the other way, I'm going to have to squeeze it a bit. One view of the meaning of saved is safe from hell. That is the most common understanding of what it means to be saved. It is not the New Testament understanding, it's come from American revivalism. And it means that people are primarily hearing the gospel as a fire escape, as an insurance policy for the next world. And they hear preachers say something like, if you die tonight, will you be in heaven or hell? That's not a way that the apostles preached. They were more concerned, if you live tomorrow, will you be living in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness? They were concerned with life more than death. They were preaching a gospel, not of being safe from hell, but of being salvaged from sins. Plural. Jesus did not come to save us from hell. That's a bonus thrown in. He is called Jesus because he came to save us from our sins. That's why he's called Jesus. He's not a hell saver, he's a sin saver. He's the Lamb of God who came to do what? To take away the sins of the world. Not just to pay the price for them, but to take them away. And until those sins have been taken away from your life, you're not fully saved. You've not been salvaged. Because this is only concerned with being saved from something. This is concerned not only with being saved from, but seeing being saved to sanctity, a holy life and being saved for service. In other words, God is in the business, to use a modern word, of recycling people. What is recycling? It's salvaging. It is to take what would be thrown away as rubbish and make it into something useful again. That's salvation. It's not just a ticket to heaven and an escape from hell, it's to be salvaged, recycled, restored to the original image so that again you can love and serve God. That's salvation. And there's no one in this room who is saved. We are all being saved. In other words, salvation is a process that we've begun, but it's not complete yet. So I can't say I'm saved, I can say I have started to be saved, and I'm being saved, and God wants to complete the work he's begun, and one day I'll be totally saved. For example, the next time some of you will see me, I will be 33 years old. Because my body's going to be redeemed, and it's going to be made like his glorious body, which as I understand it is in its prime. Jesus is not an old age pensioner staggering around, he's 33, right? That's his age, and I'm going to be like him. I can't wait to be 33 again. Can you? Well, not all of you look excited, but some of you do. You see, I'm being saved, and the outside of me is not saved yet. Not all the inside is saved yet, but I'm being saved. I'm not what I ought to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm not what I was. I'm in the process of being saved. And I'm not just being saved from something, I'm being saved to something and for something. Jesus, or the Bible, does not say that we're, God is able to save us from the uttermost. It says he's able to save us 
to the uttermost. Most people think that means from the guttermost, but it doesn't. It means to the uttermost. He's able to complete what he's begun. Let's take this a little further. This kind of gospel is concerned with getting people across the line from non-Christian to Christian, from unsaved to saved. It's concerned with that and getting people over that. That's the thinking. But in the New Testament, salvation is a line like that and it's called the way. And someone who's on it is called a disciple. And that word applies to them whether they're here or here. The word Christian I don't like because that implies you're this side of the line. The word disciple says you're on the way. Jack Hayford has a church in America called the Church on the Way. I love that. Not the church that's got everything or the church that's arrived, but the church on the way. Our aim in evangelism is not to get people across a line, but to get them on the way. And it'll take a lifetime to make a disciple. Jesus didn't tell us to go and get decisions. He said, go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. If the object of our evangelism is to get converts, we'll be on this side. If our object is to make disciples, we'll be on this. On this side, the most important thing to get is justification. On this side, justification is only the way to sanctification. This side says you come to Jesus as your Savior. This side says you come to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. And you can't accept him as Savior without accepting him as Lord. Are you beginning to see a difference here between the kind of gospel we preach? If you preach this gospel, you say all you need to do is believe, with maybe a little repentance thrown in. If you preach this gospel, you say repent, believe, be baptized, and receive. Baptism in water and in the Spirit has little to do with being safe from hell. It's got everything to do with being salvaged from sins. Do you understand? If your objective is solely to escape hell, you will not see the point of baptism in water or in spirit. But if your objective is to be salvaged from your sins and be useful to God again and be saved that way, then all those things you will need. Let's take this further. This sort of person is only interested in the minimum they need to escape hell. This person is what I call a maximum Christian who wants everything that God can give them to live right. So what kind of Christians are we going to produce? Minimum Christians who've got a ticket to heaven? Or are we going to produce Christians who want to be restored to their original condition? in which God can use them again because they are no longer perishing. In other words, which do people want to be saved from, hell or their sins? Now anybody is a fool if they don't want to be saved from hell, always assuming there is such a place. And if that's all we offer, I can't see how anybody could refuse to make a decision. But I find this is a different kind of offer. Do you want to say goodbye to your sins? Do you want to be free of those bad habits? Do you want to live right again? I've discovered that deep down people do want to live better lives. They put me on Canadian television for 20 minutes and the producer rashly said, David, you can speak about anything you like for 20 minutes. What would you like to talk about? It was the main network, the global channel. I said, well, I'd like to talk about the kingdom of God and his face fell. He said, well now, it's a commercial channel, we've got to pe keep people switched on, we've got to keep them interested. I said, I, I don't care whether they keep switched on or not. You said I could speak for 20 minutes about anything I liked. I wish the BBC would say that to me sometime. So I spoke for 20 minutes about the Kingdom of God and there were telephones in the studio for people to ring in. And the first telephone went and a woman's voice said, I've been watching your program. I'm a hooker. 
Now, you may not know what that is. In Canada, that's a prostitute. They also call them solicitors, which makes life a little difficult. But she said, I'm a hooker. I've been watching your program in Yonge Street, Toronto, that's uh, the red light district. And she said, I have a question to ask. I said, what's your question? We were still on camera. And she said, how can I get into that kingdom? I said, why do you want to get in? She said, it's time I got my life straightened out. I thought, hallelujah, we're preaching the same gospel Jesus did. Because when he preached about the kingdom, the prostitutes wanted to get in. You can soon tell if your minister's preaching the right gospel. See who's trying to get in. There's a test, isn't it? But it's good news to people. Christianity is not saying to people, you must live right. It's saying, you can live right. Not you must, you can. Because everything's on offer. The only difference between Christianity and all other religions is this. All other religions say sanctification first, justification second. Put yourself right first, live a holy life first, and then at the end God will accept you. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is that it's the other way round in Christianity. And only in Christianity God justifies you before he sanctifies you. He accepts you as his adopted son or daughter, and then he puts you right. He doesn't say, when you've put yourself right, I'll adopt you. He says, I'll adopt you now. But he only justifies us in order to sanctify us. That's an important point. He only forgives so that we can live right. To the woman taken in adultery, he said, neither do I condemn you, but don't do it again. Don't go back. I've forgiven you so that you can live right. That woman, if she lived right, would become useful to God again. She'd be able to love the Lord. Which gospel are we going to preach? An insurance policy for death or a new life that will lead straight on into heaven? A holiness that will lead to happiness. Most people want it the other way around. Most people want happiness here and holiness hereafter. God says, I want to give you holiness here and happiness hereafter. Let's have it the right way round. You see, those who say saved is simply being safe will not know where baptism in water and in spirit fit in. They will tell you all you need to do is to believe, then you've got your ticket, and that's it. But salvation is a process. It starts with justification when God accepts you and forgives you. It goes on to sanctification where he makes you holy. And it goes on to glorification when he gives you a new body and puts you in a new heaven and a new earth. And everything's put back to its original condition. I'm getting overexcited myself now. What a prospect. That's full salvation. And I'm only being saved. And I need all those four basic things to be salvaged. A safe gospel doesn't need those four things. A salvaged gospel does. And the word salvage is much nearer the word salvation than the word safe. God is not here to make us safe. He's here to salvage us to restore us to the image of his Son. That's going to take years. But God doesn't ever leave a job half done. And as we go on believing, he goes on doing the job, and we're restored day by day, until one day you and I will look just like Jesus. But you see, we are being salvaged. Not made safe, salvaged which raises, of course, the knotty question which I've dealt with fully in my book, so I can't delve into it now, this question of once saved, always saved. The trouble is people want to feel safe as quickly as possible. I'm inclined to feel that John Bunyan got it right. At the end of the journey, one of Pilgrim's friends fell. And John Bunyan wrote, Then I perceived 
there was a path to hell even from the gates of heaven. We need to take very seriously the warnings of every writer in the New Testament that it is possible to lose. Hebrews 6 is one of the best known passages and what he says there has nothing to do with can you lose your salvation. He is tackling the question, if you do lose it, can you get it back again? And his answer is no. Jesus said if the salt loses its savour, how can it be salted again? Do you know that there were two and a half million people came out of Egypt and only two of them got into Canaan? Two and a half million set out, two arrived. And that incident is used by three different writers of the New Testament as a warning to Christians. You may set out, that doesn't guarantee arrival. But go on believing, for he is able to keep what you've committed. It's very interesting that every time the scripture says God is able to keep you, in the context is another verse that says keep yourself. For example, in Jude, the last verse of Jude says, he is able to keep you from falling. But two verses ahead of that it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. There are two sides to keeping. Keep trusting and he keeps holding. It's a process of salvation and I dare to say it, none of us are safe until we stand in glory. But we're being saved and we need every bit of help we can to keep going, to keep trusting, to press on keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. That is why when you've brought a new convert through these four steps, you have begun. He hasn't arrived, but he's set off from the right departure platform. He will need to be put in a family. Every baby needs a happy family in which they can grow up and be trained. For babies are noisy, they're dirty, they need a lot of attention, they need milk every so often. And some churches are so middle-aged they don't want spiritual ba babies because spiritual babies are noisy and spiritual babies keep getting dirty and spiritual babies need a lot of milk and not a lot of meat and spiritual babies need an awful lot of attention. But pray God you are in a church that loves having babies and knows how to bring them up and teach them how to go on trusting and how to go on observing all that Jesus has taught us until finally we are able to present every man mature in Christ Jesus. My book is only about the start of the Christian life, but we need to keep our eyes on the finish. Well, you've been very patient and listened so well. One final word, I believe God has said to some of you today, you haven't got all the four basic things. And my advice is don't let that put you down. Don't let that discourage you. Don't say, oh dear, I don't feel I'm a Christian at all. The devil would love you to feel that. Listen, you are, you are a disciple. You're on the way. All I would say to you is don't rest where you are. Go on after the other things that you don't have until you get them. Have it all. Don't be a minimum Christian. Don't say, well, I get by with what I've got. Say, I want more. There's always more. There's always more and if you think you've got it all, you haven't. The worst kind of Christians to deal with are those who think they've arrived, but those who know they're on the way always want more. So go out and have babies, birth them properly, be good midwives and then look after them within the family of God until they reach the full measure of the stature of Jesus and have been salvaged and restored to the original image of God that was in them. Let's pray. Father, I just pray now that you will take all this teaching and, and sift it by your Holy Spirit and if anything I've said is not of you, will you please blot it out from our memories before it misleads or distracts. But if what I've been saying is the truth, then Lord, confirm it from your word and by your Spirit so that we may put it into action and we'll be careful to give you all the glory and the praise for it all.
You're the Father, and these are your babies. This is your family. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you would like to study the subject of the normal Christian birth in more detail, please obtain the book of the same title. This is available from a Christian bookshop, or in case of difficulty, the publisher, Hodron Stoughton Limited.